It's my pleasure, as I said, to introduce the speaker of today. He's come a long way, all the way from down under. Uh, it's Professor Dr. Holger Meyer. He's a professor of environmental engineering at the University of Adelaide in South Australia. His research interests are in developing and applying methods that result in sustainable outcomes, especially when dealing with complex systems in an uncertain environment. Examples of this include the development of decision support systems for long-term disaster risk reduction under a range of plausible futures, the development of innovative bottom-up climate change, climate impact assessment methods, the development of adaptive approaches to urban stormwater management using smart technologies, and the development of approaches supporting the decarbonization of the gas industry. Uh, Dr. Meyer is the recipient of the biannual medals from the International Environmental Modeling and Simulation Society and the Modeling and Simulation Society of Australia and New Zealand. And he's an international advisory board member of the journal Environmental Modeling and Software. And today he's going to talk as an engineer, putting people at the center. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you, Holger, and um, please give him a hand of applause. Thanks. Thank you for the kind introduction, Roy, and thanks for coming along, everybody. Um, yeah, so today I'll, I'll talk about the, the climate impact work. Um, we've sort of been going on for about eight years, I suppose, and um, this particular project is something that we're just starting. So when I get back, um, I'll be leading this, this project. So that's sort of a, the culmination of where we've gotten to, um, but it's obviously an ongoing journey, and yeah, hopefully you can... Yeah, it'd be great to hear your views on this and to, I guess, invite you as well to be part of this because it's a, it's a big problem and we all need to work together um, to get there. So, uh, the problem, I guess, this I, that we've been looking at um, is really the fact that, you know, we think hopefully we can all agree that we need to do something about climate change pretty urgently. But I'm not sure what it's like you know, for you in Canada, but in Australia, um, there, there's not much action. You know, there's there's you know, a lot of talk, but when it comes to putting money on the table or doing things, there's just not much happening and a lot of deferrals and, oh, we can do that later, or it just seems to be too difficult. Um, and I guess the question is, why is that happening? And obviously, that's a, you know, <laughs> that's very complicated. There's, I'm not going to say, look, I've got the answer. Um, you know, it's not, there's no silver bullet, and it's, there are lots of different factors. But I think it's important for us to think about, you know, why is there insufficient action um, to address climate change? And also then, what can we do about it? How can we actually increase that? And again, you know, there, there's multifaceted, complex answers, and I'm just focusing on a very small bit around the modeling and the technical side of things, um, but hopefully it's something that we can you know, uh, work towards. Um, so in terms of you know, why is there insuffic insufficient action to address climate change? So my, um, just from the modeling perspective, uh, I really think that traditional methods are too focused on providing information and not on solving problems. And when you think about how we go about climate impact assessment. You know, we start with our you know, socioeconomic pathways and then the relative concentration of the carbon pathways. And they're varied and around those we put the different uh, GCM models and then we end up with a, you know, a wide range of possible outcomes. And then we run them through our system model, which again is uncertain. And then we end up with a you know, really a wide range of performance and, and nobody knows what to do with that. Um, and really, I think when you think about it, you know, there's all this talk about climate change. That's what we're starting with. You know, the climate's changing. We need to better understand how the climate's changing. And, and a lot of effort's going into the modeling of that. So the climate science is really dictating that whole narrative and is driving everything. And so it's really much information-centric. You know, um, and yeah, nobody's talking about, you know, it's all about let's just look at what the climate's doing and then just propagate that through and see what that means. Um, and so it is that information-centric approach. And it's useful. I mean, it does give you information about how the system might perform under a different range of futures, but it's really you know, an impact assessment, right? It's saying, well, this is what could happen, but it's not really linked to decisions or action. There's a disconnect. And so my little diagram here, really, you know, you've got stuff you want to do, and then you've got information that's basically too much information a lot of the time. It's just this huge range of stuff, and you really don't know how to reconcile the two. And that really leads to that decision paralysis where people just go, oh, I don't know what to do. I need better information. And so really the onus is on, we, we, we're looking for climate scientists to give us better information. So how do we overcome that? And when you think about, you know, from an engineering perspective, 
we make decisions or decisions are made all the time in the absence of um, good information. Just, if you're designing a, a bridge or a culvert in an ungauged basin, for example, you don't just say, oh, well, sorry, I can't do that. We need to wait for 10 or 30 years until we've collected all the data and then I can do you a really good analysis. Um, so, you know, we, we do it all the time. So, what, you know, and so really that's that conceptual shift I think we need to make to go from, you know, rather than looking at the information and science, say, look, we need better information to say, look, we just want to make a, a decision here. We need to make sure the system keeps functioning into the future. How do we do that? What information do we need? How do we make it work? Because we do that all the time. Engineering is about making stuff work, um, you know, in the, in the absence of good information most of the time. And so really, it's the, the, the shift is really starting with the, the decision or the performance of the system and then figuring out what information we need to achieve that outcome, rather than starting with the, you know, this is the, the climate's changing, what do we do? Um, and so it's still the same process, but it's much more focused and targeted. You know, so rather than you know, running every climate scenario, you're just saying, look, my system is really um, sensitive to, you know, it could be extreme events or it could be sensitive to the dry spell duration. So how is that? You know, and, and what performance would I like to see into the future, and then you know, how is that likely to change as a result of climate, and, and you know, what, how do I ad, uh, adapt my system to make it still function? So it's, it's the same mechanics, but it's just you know, really narrowing down the information and make it more targeted. Now the downside is, of course, it's, it's, you, know, you have to do this for different systems, so it's not one size fits all. The, the thing people like about the climate scenarios is that you just have oh, a consistent set of scenarios, we run it through everything, everything's just consistent, but you end up with just this you know, huge bunch of information you don't, know, you don't know what to do with. In this way, you have to really start with, okay, this is our system, these are its attributes, these are its sensitivities, its vulnerabilities, how is that going to change? So that's really the thinking. And so really it's uh, based around action or decisions. It provides information on, on what climate conditions result um, you know, in, in, in the desired system performance. And really you're connecting information to decisions because you're starting with the decision you want to make and not the information. So that's really the premise. And just to summarize, really there's lots of different terminologies as well, which is confusing. It doesn't help, but really the, you know, the Traditional approach is more information-centric, or you, you, you would have heard top-down climate impact assessments, um, climate-centric, uh, science-centric, whereas the other approach has got a lot of different names, decision-centric, bottom-up, scenario-neutral, stress-testing, vulnerability-centric, people-centric, context-aware, decision-scaling, engineering-centric, all these things are sort of falling to that bucket. And so just in, as a bit of an advert, advertisement, we've tried to sort of unpack some of this, so there's a, this has been accepted, um, and so that, that paper should come out soon. It's a, uh, really led by the Melbourne Uni group, so Keir Fowler and Tom McMahon and Avril Horn and Rory Nathan and Andrew John, but also Seth Wester and myself from Adelaide Uni and Dan Lugo and um, Joseph Guillaume from ANU. So hopefully, yeah, if you're interested in finding out more about those approaches, that might be helpful. The other way to look at it, of course, is um, from a scenario perspective. So if you think about scenario literature, um, you know, the, the traditional approach is more exploratory scenarios. You just you know, try and see what happens. Whereas the other approach, the bottom-up approach, is more um, normative scenarios. You're basically saying you know, what scenarios or what um, result in a certain outcome. And again, we've tried to unpack some of that in, in this paper here in 2016. So it's not, it's not new. You know, people have thought about this issue uh, for, for a long time. It's just a matter of, you know, for some reason, we've sleepwalked into this you know, um, climate science-dominated uh, narrative where it's all about, you know, yeah, we need to better information, we need better models. And, then, and, and from my experience, people in water authorities and things, they just sit on their hands and say, oh, well, we need to wait. You know, we'll wait until we get better information, and then, we can, then it'll help. But it's, it's, it's not, and we can't wait. So. Um, and so basically, just to summarize then, I think you know, we, there are methods um, that can help us, um, I guess, facilitate action in a better way or make it easier to, to make decisions and to um, act rather than just wait um, for better information. And so you know, the, the, the approach is sort of focused on outcomes and decisions, not drivers and information. So I think that's really key. Um, and we do not we don't need to wait for new climate information. Now, we've got a lot of information. There's too much information. It's really about how does that information help us making decisions. We need to think about what decisions we need to make. Um, 
And also the other good thing about this is you can use multiple lines of evidence. So in the top-down approach, it's all GCM driven. Um, whereas in the other way, you can sort of think about, well, you know, other other lines of evidence. Is it expert opinion or could it be tree ring data or paleo data? All that information you can bring to bear um, to really help you understand under what conditions something might um, might not be um, uh, acceptable. So this is the diagram of this sort of bottom-up scenario neutral you know, decision-centric approach. So the POF et al. 2015 in Nature Climate Change. Um, and you can see the steps that they've proposed. So basically defining a system performance criteria, building a system model, conducting the vulnerability analysis, evaluating options to inform um, decisions, and then finally picking the best decisions and going through some loops if you need to. So that's all nice. Um, and so we've, I guess that's sort of the general approach. And so we've done a bit of work, I guess, over the last sort of eight to 10 years to try and enhance various aspects of that. And I'll just take you through that story a little bit, uh, if, if that's all right. Um, and so really our group at Adelaide, um, yeah, we've, we've been working on this. So Seth Wester and myself have sort of been leading that work. And we've had other people, other academics like Michael Leonard, Bree Bennett, um, Matt Noling, Mark Thayer, and Aaron Zekin have been involved at various times. We've had postdocs, so David McInerney and Sam Cully, um, and Anjana when she was there for a, for a while. And then we've got some, like Dan Lugo, who did a PhD on this work. She's now an academic at uh, ANU in Canberra. And also Ruby is one of our graduates. She's been doing quite a bit of work to help us out. So that's sort of the, the group at Adelaide working in this space. And just, yeah, so. The first bit was really looking at this whole um, decision part. How do we, you know, how can we adapt decisions? How do we make better decisions into the future? And so the question was really, how can we increase system, systems adaptive capacity to changes in climate? And so that's where it kicked it off. And it was really an honours project. So I'm not, in, in, in Australia, we have um, in engineering um, students do, it's a four-year degree, I think the same as here, but they do their honours as part of that. And that requires a research project and it's usually done in, in groups. And so we had, uh, so Sam Carley, who's been actually working with me since then, PhD, postdocs, and he's still, still there. Um, uh, yeah, so Sam um, and Steph and Adam and Tim and, and Michael were basically the, the students, and then Seth and I were the supervisors, and then we worked with um, Matteo Giuliani and Andrea Castelletti from the Politecnic Politecnico di Milano on this as well, because we worked on the Lake Como system. Tough place to visit, um, yeah, it's a good case study. And so basically the, the question was, you know, like Como, we had sort of dual system um, multi-purpose reservoir. We just looked at two objectives, flood control and irrigation, and looked at climate drivers related to precipitation and temperature. And really the, the question was under what conditions, future conditions, will the system fail? And, and what can we do about that? Can, is there something we can do to really you know, increase the adaptive capacity of the system? And so, again, starting with a basic climate stress test, you've got your exposure space, we've got change in temperature and change in precipitation. And really, with a stress test, you, you basically have a grid of you know, different combinations of those futures. And that's why it's sometimes called scenario neutral. I mean, they're all, each of these dots is a scenario of a future climate, but it's not a, a scenario like that's proposed by the IPCC or something like that. It's just a, you know, a regular stress test to see under what conditions things change. And really what you do is you pick you know, any, any of those points, and for those changes in the exposure space, you generate time series of the variables, so in this case temperature and rainfall. You run that through your system model, uh, and then you end up with you know, what the performance of the system will be for that point in space, and then you can see whether it's acceptable or not. And so in this case, we found that for that particular point, it was unacceptable in terms of the flood objective. So you know, under that future change in temperature and, and rainfall, the system wouldn't work. I should say um, what we're looking here is um, not so much the infrastructure, but more the operational system. So we, we've used the operational, um, well, the, the operational rules that are currently used. And really we're saying is, you know, if you keep operating the system as it is now, would it fail under those conditions or not? And then you do that for every point. And then you do that for both objectives, and so you end up with this nice sort of diagram, the dotty plots, um, where you can see you can see in the blue bit in the middle, basically under those future conditions, or you know, under those conditions, really, there's no time element to this. Um, you know that it'll work for both objectives, 
um, on the bottom right, it basically um, fails um, for irrigation. On the bottom left, it fails for, um, well, flood. And then on the far top, it fails for both objectives. So that's really useful. I mean, obviously, in the ideal world, you could track where you are, you know, and then you get into attribution issues, you know, what's the actual current climate. But it sort of gives you a nice map to say, look, this is, you know, we're getting close to the edge of, of failure, and therefore, we now need to think about, you know, um, doing something, whether it's operational or whether it's infrastructure upgrade. So it's, and because it's independent of um, the climate, well, unless processes change, and then you get, you know, the model will have to change. But, but generally speaking, you know, that's sort of. Um, time invariant, you can just plot where you are in that space. But then, as I said, that's for the current operational conditions, but then we can ask the question, well, can, what can we do to increase the adaptive capacity? And so what we did is we basically optimize, for each of these points, we optimize, we use run an optimization algorithm and figure out what's the optimal operational strategy um, under those conditions. Um, and then we sort of grouped them. You didn't want, you know, you don't want to have like a hundred different strategies. We sort of, you know, came up with four or five strategies that worked for a, a region of that space. And then you end up with something that's pretty nice. You can see all the green dots are really now the, the, the areas that were, had failed under current conditions, or under current operational strategies. And you can then, if you optimize them, you can actually make the system work in that, that extra space. So it's really very useful from a management perspective and gives you an idea of, you know, this is the best we can do. If we go outside of that green area, we really need to start thinking about infrastructure options. And the other thing is then you can overlay your climate scenarios. I mean, you know, you can sort of see how likely, not in the strict, you know, probabilistic sense, but you can sort of see, you know, where do the, where do the actual um, GCM projections land in that space? You know, do they land in the green space or do they land outside of that? And so when you do that, you can see in this particular case, you know, in 2025, 50, 75, 2100, you can see most of the scenarios actually fall within the green or blue space. So it's all good. We can manage that. But and then you've got a few rogue ones that sort of sit outside in the, and then you can start looking at those and say, well, where does that come from? You know, which GCM is that, you know, is that applicable? How well does that perform in my region? So you can make more informed judgments as to, you know, whether that's a problem or not. And the other thing, as I said, you can do is you can use other lines of evidence. So you can, you know, particularly for that particular, those scenarios that are of concern, you can start bringing in experts or you can start looking at paleo data or something like that and say, look, is this really, you know, likely to, is this a problem or not? So it's, as I said, it's much more focused on that particular decision and you, you're bringing in evidence to support your decision rather than starting with information and saying, you know, well, what does that do? So that was that bit of work. Um, and then, I guess, moving more into the actual nuts and bolts of how we do that stress test. I made a couple of sort of statements around, oh, we just generate these time series and then, you know, those sort of things and, and which axes do you use? And so we've done a bit of work on that as well. So firstly is, you know, how do we obtain realistic estimates of these climate perturbed conditions and each grid cell um, under which to assess system performance? And it's not easy. Um, and so, so this was one of the um, papers from Dan Liu's PhD, and we've sort of that's sort of I guess the centerpiece, sort of where we've got the the what we call the inverse approach, which is really just a calibration approach. I'll explain in a minute. So traditionally, you know, the, the the scaling is sort of what's been used traditionally. You know, you just take a time series and you just scale it up or down by the mean. But obviously, you don't, you know, the intermittency and the you know the the extremes don't, you know, that that would change as well under climate change, and we just don't. Do that, and it's it's a very simple approach, but it's not very realistic. So to overcome that, people have started using stochastic generators. So using a weather generator, you can you know produce different time series that are more realistic. Um, but then what people have done is they've sort of you know changed the parameters of the weather generator in a regular fashion, but there's a nonlinear mapping from the parameter space of the generator to that exposure space that you're interested in, and you might basically only you know, you're not covering the whole space that you want. You're basically just covering a small bit. And then people have used scaling again to expand it to the boundaries. And so really what we've done very simply is just to flip it around and start with the exposure space and work backwards using calibration to say, well, what parameters in the weather generator give you that point in the exposure space? Um, and that, you know, works really well. You can generate all the, you know, stochastic time series you want and they, they're realistic. I mean, obviously it depends on your stochastic weather generator, um, but, but you can do that. 
So that's really the very simple idea we came up with. Um, and so, as I said, you know, the idea is really that you, you pick your exposure, your point in the exposure space, um, have a stochastic weather generator, use your search algorithm to calibrate the weather generator to give you the um, outputs with the statistics that you, that you want. Um, but there are some optimization issues, and so part of Sam's PhD was really to look at those bits that Dan Lu didn't quite address in her PhD. And so just as a simple example, um, you know, if, you, if you're interested in, in um, you know, you might be interested in, in rainfall, um, and you know, you might be able to get really good statistics for the rainfall, but because, you know, you're not constraining other variables, your temperature might be 10,000 degrees or something, you know, something unrealistic. So it's a matter of um, finding a balance between constraining variables so that they're realistic and still being able to solve the optimization problem. So it's that over under constrained issue. And so, um, so that yeah, in this paper, we talk about how a process to go, to go through that. All right. um, also related to the vulnerability analysis is the issue of um, you know, what axes do you use um, in the exposure space? And if you look at all of these sort of bottom up or, you know, um, these types of papers, they're all just saying, oh, let's take you know, average temperature and average um, rainfall, um, like we did in the first papers. Because that's, you know, but, but basically the whole premise of the bottom up is that you understand the vulnerabilities of the system. You know, is, it the, you know, is it the 99th percentile extreme rainfall or is it the, you know, the dry spell duration? What, 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 what is it that makes your system fail? Um, and we had a lot of trouble actually getting those papers through because people you know, don't, I think people probably don't want to move away from their simple, let's just take two variables and we don't want to do any extra work. Anyway, um, and so we've had a couple of papers. So again, part of Dan Lu's PhD, she looked at, um, I guess, more of an exploratory study where we use sort of sensitivity analysis um, just to really understand, you know, if you, if you look at different, um, I guess, um, hydrologic variables of interest, uh, which climate attributes have the biggest impact of those, and does it change? You know, is, are there, is it always the same hydrologic variables that are most important, or does it change with, you know, depending on your management objective? And so it was just a simple study and looking at a, a rainfall runoff study in the Scott Creek catchment in Adelaide. And you can sort of see in the top, um, you know, this is not a real, I mean, it's a real problem, but we haven't, it's not a real management problem. We've just sort of looked at different variables of interest, you know, like daily average rainfall, you know, extreme rainfall, all these different things, which might be of interest depending on the problem you're trying to solve. And then on the, the bottom table is basically saying, you know, what are the climate attributes that might influence that. And again, we've got a daily rainfall intensity, you know, again, all the different seasonal factors and things like that. Um, and then we basically just did a big sensitivity analysis to see you know, which, of these, um, which of these factors have the biggest impact on the objective that, you interest, that you're interested in. And you can see, well, yeah, here we go. And, um, and then you can see, it, don't worry about the details, that the key message here is that on the, on the bottom, you've got these attributes from the top table and the different colored bars are the different um, climate attributes. And the, the main point is that they're different. They know the, the, the relative contribution of the climate variables to the different management objectives varies. And so you, know, you, you can't just use the same axes every time you do a climate impact assessment. So if you do an, an, an assessment based on yield, for example, you need, you need different axes. And if you're looking at you know, flood, for example, and that makes sense, it's just that people conveniently skip over that step and just you know, focus on the actual exposure space analysis part. Um, and as part of Sam's PhD, we took it one step further and developed an actual methodology or an approach for doing that. And we really drew heavily on, um, I guess, when you, those, those of you who are familiar with machine learning or, uh, you know, it's really the input variable selection. You know, if, you know when you've got a data-driven model, you really need to figure out what the inputs are. And you look at your, you know, you see which ones have the biggest influence. And so we use sort of partial mutual information um, as a way of selecting the, the climate um, attributes that have the biggest impact on your system. And again, we, we looked at a, a, a much broader range of climate attributes um, in this particular study, and we looked at the Lake Como system and the two different objectives, so flood reliability and irrigation deficit. And again, the main message here is that if you look at, um, so the order means just the, which, which of these factors has the most, um, the biggest influence on, on the flood reliability and irrigation. 
And you can see they're different, and that's really the key message. Again, if you're looking at these two objectives, the climate factors that have the biggest influence vary. So if you want to stress test your system, um, you need to use different axes to stress test. You can't use the same, you know, just the, the basic ones we used in the first paper. Um, and so that's all well and good, you know, all these different methods and techniques. So I guess we, you know, in, in order to make that more accessible to people, we've sort of developed an R package that is freely available. Um, so Foresight is the R package. It's on CRAN, um, and there's a paper in EMS on it if you want to find out more. But Again, it's something that we're very open to collaborating with people. You know, we want this stuff to be used. And yeah, if you do, if you find it useful or you want to have a play with it, um, it's still, it's an, you know, like with all software, research-based software, it's a, it's a living thing. Um, we've sort of done quite a bit of work on making the optimization more efficient, for example, um, and that, that, that David McEnany has worked on. Um, but yeah, so that's an ongoing thing. But you know, it's really something, if you're interested and want to use it, yeah, feel free to, and we're very happy to, to collaborate with people in that space. And just very simply, it does, you know, you can create the exposure space, you can and generate the, you know, with the, there's different weather generators in there, um, you know, from simpler to more complicated, and we're adding them as we, you know, they, we're working on that side of things as well. You can plug in your own system model, and then it does all the, the plotting and visualizations as well to get the plots at the end. Right, so, so far it's been more about the, the analysis bits and the bottom half of that sort of that process. And so I guess but a lot of that's predicated on that you know what you actually want. You know, the whole idea of that, yeah, you know what the system performance is. It's got a nice little diagram there in the POF paper where people just sit around the table and go, yeah, no, this is what we want, this is our performance. And you've got a nicely crisply defined value that you're looking for, everything's wonderful. Um, and similarly, your, your model. You know, most, most people don't talk about the model very much. You just take whatever model you have. And, and so, so there really are some questions around that too if you really want to start moving into practical applications of this. Because particularly when you start looking at stakeholder engagement and matters of issues of trust, you know, do people trust the model? Do they trust, you know, are these values really what the community wants? All those sorts of things. Um, and so some of the issues are, you know, who should the stakeholders be? Who's at the table? Because if you've got different people at the table, you have different objectives or different desired outcomes. And so that really has a big influence. Um, and what values are important to your community now and into the future? You know, is, is it going to change in, in 100 years' time, or is it the same? Um, and also, how do we quantify those values? And on the modeling side, you've got things like, you know, what is the system boundary? You know, which, which, what, which bits are external, which bits are actually part of your modeling? Um, can we model all the important factors or, or, you know, or, or not? Um, and also, how do we model the system dynamics appropriately? Because you know, this is the dynamics into the future that's really going to affect how well the system performs and how well an adaptation strategy will work. And they're obviously related as well, because if your stakeholders want to include certain things, your system boundary might change and you might have to model other things as well. So we're very fortunate to work um, with the state government in South Australia. So the Barossa region, I don't know if there's any wine drinkers here, but it's a very, very important region. Um, it, yeah, it's a pretty well, um, world-renowned region for producing wine. Unfortunately, I think that little, system, that little inset doesn't mean much to you. So if you imagine, well, so Adelaide is, Adelaide is here. Um, and then you've got sort of Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Perth. Anyway, that might give you some idea. But it's sort of just to the north. It's about two hours north of, um, of Adelaide. Um, but seriously, they've had basically three or four years with the, the rivers not flowing. Um, and so there's a real you know, danger that uh, you know, there have to be a wholesale change of um, you know, the sort of what the industry and, and everything is going to be in the region. And they used to have a stone fruit in there, and they, there was already a shift from stone fruit to, to viticulture, and now there might have to be a, another change um, as well. So they're really looking at that water security strategy, and um, yeah, so we worked with people in the government um, to really yeah, help them develop that strategy, which is now online, and it's, it's published. But basically, you know, the, the key was that we're looking at the, the combi combination of the qualitative and quantitative because, you, you know, you want to start, you know, you need, the community needs to be brought along. It's, it's, their, it's their region, you know, they need to be, you know, well, obviously, they need to decide what they want their, their region to look like into the future. 
and our job was really just to try and help facilitate that um, the workshop process, but also then the, the modelling side of things. And you can see the links between them. So obviously, you know, we had the workshops and semi-structured interviews helped us to define the, the modelling. Um, um, yeah, and so we could sort of yeah, link, link the two. It's not, that work's not published in journal papers. We've got one under review and one that sort of should be submitted at some point. Um, um, so that, that should come out, but there is a technical report, but that's not, that's not available um, to the public, I don't think. So really, but that bottom diagram is all in the, um, in the official report. So you can see we had three stakeholder workshops. One was about visioning, you know, what would you like your future to look like? Um, and then basically, uh, you know, looking at uncertainties and planning for them and then looking at the adaptation strategies. And, and so we, we were part of the workshop process, but then we went away and took the results and did the modeling and presented that back in the next workshop. And so it was a really good process. You can see the timelines there. Um, so it went for a, for a bit of time, but it, yeah, it all ended up in that strategy and now as a, we're doing a similar thing in Claren Vale, which is another wine growing region in the south of Adelaide, but also the project which I'll talk about at the end that I'm, um, I'm leading, we're really um, doing, repeating this process or adapting it obviously, but for, uh, for other regions in South Australia, so that's been very positive that the, you know, the whole process has been received very well and people want to you know, repeat it and they can see the value of it. So that's really good. Um, in terms of the modeling, so interestingly, I'm not sure what it's like here, but when we asked for the different models, the, it, and the, you know, the groundwater people don't usually talk to the surface water people, and when you do the mass balances, they don't add up. And so nobody you know, put the two models together, um, and so we had to somehow reconcile all of that. And there was no demand model, and also the, you know, the viticulture demand model, there was something there, but not, not a lot. And so obviously, if you're looking at you know, how, whether a region you know, will, you know, how well it'll perform into the future, you need to actually look at the whole you know, unmet demand in terms of water supply security. So you need all these different factors to talk to each other and interact with each other, and all the different adaptation strategies need to be in the model as well. And so we ended up, it was just not possible to actually link the existing models in that way. Um, and so we ended up with a system dynamics modeling approach where we basically just try to abstract the key dynamics and features from each of those component models and then put it all together and did a lot of testing to make sure all the, you know, the performance and the um, behavior of the model was realistic and reflected what was actually happening in those um, source models. Um, but that, that worked really well as, as an approach to really capture all the different um, interactions and dynamics into the future. And you can see all those different component models that are reflected in different ways in here. And by running that, we basically figured out that, yes, there is a problem. So there's a eight gigalitre of, you know, of shortfall, basically. Um, and then this was done using the foresight package. You can see the resulting, the plots you can get out of it. You can get those nice um, plots which you can tell you what's, what's going on in the exposure space and the stress testing. And similarly with the water supply security, uh, that was some issues there as well. And then looking at the ad at adaptive pathways, and again, these different um, categories, pathways, that really came out of those community consultations. So, you know, there was a, you know, do you want to focus on investment to support industry? Or do you want to look at sustainability and clean production? Do you want to look at healthy waterways? Or do you just, you know, want to make sure we've got as much water as we can um, have? And so there were the different things we were able to model in the system dynamics model. And you can sort of see where the different points were, are where you can put those interventions in and then do the stress testing and see what happens. And you can see, so on the left is the plot basically of business as usual, if we don't do anything, so lots of red, which isn't good, so you've got shortfall. And then when you look at those four different pathways, you can see that you're starting to get, um, you know, you're able to get to 90% reliability. Um, and obviously the max water thing is, is, you know, you're getting some surplus there. So it's a matter of finding that balance between do you just want to max out the water supply or do you want to look after the rivers and the health of them as well and other community aspects. So um, this is the last bit of the talk. Um, so this is really what we're trying to move into. And so when I, um, yeah, as I don't know if I've mentioned, but I've had just that six weeks of vacation in Europe and um, 
um, while I was away, all the contracts have been signed. And so, um, yeah, when I come back, we'll, we'll start this project, which I'm leading. Um, and so it's really to try and put it all together and actually have a, an impact um, to just to, to change the culture of how we do these climate risk assessments and actually, you know, switching from what we're doing now, which is just running lots of scenarios, to, to this sort of approach. So it'll be uh, interesting. So that's what the title of the talk is, and that's the title of the project, so putting um, people at the centre towards um, transforming climate risk assessments for water security and delivery. And again, it's that idea of, you know, not just starting with the climate science, but starting with what people actually want and what, they, what the future to look like, and listening to that and then building everything around that. Um, and so just to acknowledge the people, so I'm, I'm leading the project, so Joel Bailey from Murray-Darling Basin Authority is the industry lead, Avril Horn from Melbourne Uni is the uh, is sort of deputy research lead, but we're really co-leading it. Um, then we've got Matt Armstrong and Sam Cully, our postdocs at Adelaide, and Andrew John at Melbourne Uni. And we've got Seth and Matt and Michael Leonard, Mark Thayer, and Aaron Zekin from Adelaide Uni, Rory Nathan from Melbourne Uni, and then we've got uh, Wendy, Serena, and Karine, uh, Karina, it should be, um, from ANU who are sort of social scientists, so will help us with all the um, workshop stuff. So it's a it's an interesting project, and someone was in there too, but he he's moved back here. So, um, and so again, the aim is really to, to have that cultural shift from this top bit, which I've talked about. You know, that that sort of really starting with climate change and propagating that through. Um, and the thing we've talked about a lot is information to action ratio. So in, in that particular approach, you've got a lot of information but not much action because people don't know what to do with it. To moving to this more people-centric approach or decision-centric approach, bottom-up, whatever you want to call it, where you're starting with the action and you're starting, the starting point is what decision do you want, what should the future look like for your region, um, what are the most important factors, and then tailoring your climate scenarios to, to stress test um, under those conditions that are really important. And hopefully that, you know, you're getting more tailored information and you're getting more action and you, in, you're basically changing that ratio between information and action. That's the hope. Um, and it's, it's a three-year project at the moment, but it's funded, I should have mentioned that, sorry, that was a bit of an oversight. The one base in CRC, so in Australia we have these cooperative research centres, so they're really a collaboration between industry and, and researchers. And generally the way it works is the federal government, it's, it's a competitive bidding process, but the federal government puts in about half the money and then industry puts in the other half. Um, and this one is, the, is about the Murray-Darling Basin, so it's really, it's, the Murray-Darling Basin covers about one-seventh of Australia's surface area, it's a, it's a huge, you know, deal in terms of agriculture and really we're looking at, um, you know, how to make that more you know, productive, resilient and sustainable irrigation regions is sort of the, the tagline for the CRC. And the really nice thing about CRCs is there's like a 10-year, it's a 10-year funding program. Um, and so it's not like, you know, you do a two or three year project and then see you later. It's like you can actually think about how do we affect change, how do we transform things? Because, you know, what, what should the region look like in 10 years time? Not what do I do in my project, but, you know, what, what are we trying to achieve in 10 years time? And so even though our current funding is for three years, we've mapped it out as a, as a nine year project essentially because you know, we want to affect that change. And if you want to change culture and the way people do things as a matter of course, you can't do that in a three year project. So you have to you need to have a longer term plan. So it's, it's quite ambitious and it's a bit scary to be honest. Um, but I think we need to, have a, need to have a crack and see what happens. But this is sort of our uh, a theory of change model that we're using, so I guess it's, built around niching to some extent, where we're sort of starting with a number of case studies. So we've got four case studies in different regions, so one in South Australia, two in Victoria, one in New South Wales. Um, and and by, by doing that, we, I guess we're hopefully building you know, momentum, enthusiasm, getting champions um, who really you know, see it works, and then you know, they can sort of, we can propagate that, so it's more like the sourdough sort of model. We can hopefully build it and then you know, get, get, get through those other stages. But, um, but obviously envisioning is part of the, the, you know, really important part of the process to figure out where do you want to go. Um, and so in terms of more practical things, the way we're sort of thinking about it is that initially we have a, a smallish number of case studies that are basically where the researchers are sort of the main drivers because we, you know, we sort of have, have you know, some idea of what we want to do and get bring people on board, but then as we move through the years, we have more case studies and the, the balance shifts from you know, researchers leading it to more 
supporting it. And, and the idea is also to develop you know, software and analytical tools that are really simple to use um, so that people can actually, yeah, they will use them. Not, we don't have to have a supercomputer or a researcher to do it. So that's, again, that's the theory and we'll just see how it goes. But, um, but so that's what we're aiming for. Obviously, funding in the subsequent years will depend on how we go in the first three years, but um, yeah, we'll see. And so in terms of our um, approach, so that's sort of the conceptual model. It's all co-designed, so really that's the people at the center pit of the project. So it all, you know, it's all built around co-design, um, and then you've got these things on the outside, which is really, you know, ultimately we want to end up with this, this approach that we can use, and we find that over the, over the years. Um, but to do that via case studies, so you need some sort of you know, prototype methodology which you can apply to the case studies. Um, and so really it's that, you know, that sort of circle around there, around the, you know, the case study methodology informing the actual proper methodology. And then by doing the case studies, you can then again inform the methodology. And so these are sort of roughly the steps. You've got your stakeholder selection and then, you know, case study scoping, figuring out what people actually want, um, visioning and establishment of values, um, identifying the key climate drivers, which I've talked about, assessment and discussion of climate risk. That's all the analysis and stuff is just in that one little box. Um, and then looking at adaptive pathways and lots of feedback loops because it's not going to be a linear process. Then also for the case studies, we've got you know, a lot of engagement of um, First Nations and local stakeholders because, again, if you want to have credibility and make sure it, it gets adopted and, and you, you can't just be sitting in your office and doing some computer modeling, you really need to, you know, make sure that you, you listen to people and, and get their views on board. Um, and that's where you've got the, you know, some discussion across the case studies as well. What are the generic learnings we can take from that? Um, and then also some specialist technical input if we need it. And again, this is sort of a, you know, the, it's, 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 a, it's a messy process by, just by, by, by its nature. It's not going to be this, yeah, we'll do this. We've got some idea, but it'll be very different when we actually do it. But you go through this spiral over time where we just, you know, do the assessment, reflect on it, adapt, apply it to the case studies, and just keep doing that for different case studies and hopefully keep um, learning over time. So um, in terms of take our messages then. Um, so I think we do need to take urgent action on climate change, but again, from my experience, and it'll be interesting to hear your, your views, but you know, that not, not enough is being done. Uh, and I think at least, you know, as I said, it's a complex problem, but from a information and modeling perspective, I think a, a big part of that is that existing methods are information centric. So we're starting off with, you know, the climate's changing. Um, and then propagating that through and, and, and basically relying on, you know, we just need better data on climate change and everything will fix itself. So, you know, I think having methods that are more solution centric um, will be helpful to, to try and, I guess, progress that agenda of, of getting more action. Um, and I guess we've tried to do a little bit in that space, um, you know, to, to improve some methods um, in, in different ways. So looking at, you know, adaptive capacity, the optimization, the study plots, um, how do we generate realistic climate perturbed time series? How do we identify the key climate variables that affect the system? How do we engage stakeholders to come up with the visioning? And how do we you know, model systems in a more complex systems in a way that's helpful in that context? And yeah, all of that hopefully will feed into this, this new project, which will hopefully be for the next nine years, but we'll, we'll see. Um, but you know, we obviously, you know, it's, it's to, to change a culture and, and it needs to be the more people the better and so I guess my you know there's an open invitation anybody wants to collaborate on this or have any interest in it whatsoever we're very open to that because we do need to work together um, because the problem is pretty big so thank you so much for coming and I'm very happy to yeah answer questions thank you thank you very much Holger so there is time for questions I can start. 
while you think about your name, <laughs> maybe just a quick question. Yeah. I was just wondering about these uh, stakeholders, and you're you're talking about wine cultivation and uh, uh, livestock, um, but there must be other stakeholders, uh, residents, um, and you had the Murray Dar Darling uh, River Basin on on board as well. They 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 are very worried about e flow, so the environment. So who's representing environment? Is is this going to be part of your new project? Yeah, definitely. So the. The four case studies, we haven't fully, you know, because they're actually defining the case studies as part of the project proper, um, but with as part of preliminary discussion, so there's one in South Australia in the Riverland that's probably more focused on the water supply security, like the Barossa. Uh, in New South Wales, it's probably more likely to be the environmental flow side of things. Um, and the two in Victoria um, could be quite different. One could be more around the, the regional future, so tourism is a big part of that, and also there's threats of fires. And, and one could actually be around pulling together different um, existing uh, strategic plans and how actually working with the organisation to help them figure that out. So the stakeholders will be different depending on the question you're trying to answer. But certainly in the Barossa we had, you know, we had First Nations representation, we had sort of local farmers and, yeah, and, and uh, uh, citizens and, and people looking at the uh, water supply side of things and the environmental flow side of things and health, ecology, all those different things, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Please, please say your name. Yeah. Hi, my name is Rodrigo. During your presentation, I was thinking about uh, Mexico City and how recently uh, people have been discussing how indigenous peoples of Mexico used to have a very efficient flood management system before colonization and how now Mexico City has a really big problem with flooding. And towards the end of your presentation, you mentioned that you uh, plan or engage already with Aboriginal groups of Australia. So I wanted to know if you have already engaged with those groups and what they have contributed to, to your research. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So we haven't, so part of it is that the, the CRC has a very strong focus on First Nations and so that's, um, but at the time the project was conceived, you know, they, that wasn't sort of set up. Um, so we have a, a plan to maybe do that in the subsequent stages because also, you know, one thing I've learned is it takes time. You know, it's not like, you know, you need to sit with people and listen, you know, the, the, sometimes the time scales are quite different. You know, when we, when we, when we had a, our first sort of annual workshop for the CRC, you know, they were talking, oh, we've got 10 years, and then, you know, the uh, Aboriginal people said, oh, 10 years is nothing, you know, like, and so, so that it needs to be done properly. You know, we don't want to have a tokenistic, you know, we've talked to somebody, you know, it needs to be proper engagement, and, 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 um, and so we didn't, you know, given the time terms, you couldn't put it, there's no budget for that. Um, in this particular part, so we will try what we, we, will, we will do what we can. And as part of the case studies, people might have connections already, we've talked to them, so some of the end users have got connections, and so we'll see how to incorporate that. Um, so it is important, but I think, you know, the, the issue you mentioned really resonates with me in terms of some of the bushfire stuff that's happening in Australia as well. Um, and, but it's, it's quite complicated because, you know, the systems have changed. You know, I think we definitely it needs to be one part of the conversation and one part of the solution, op potential solutions. But I, I, generally, I don't think we can just, you know, adopt what's been done before because, you know, systems have changed a lot since that time. And so we need to learn from that and listen and put it in the mix. Um, but I think, you know, the solutions to those problems will be a, a, a mixture of different things. That's sort of my general sense. But it, yeah. Any other questions? Can I ask you a question about the actions? Um, so, can you give us examples of actions, like when you when you talked about external sources for water? Are you are you considering, for example, um, uh, wastewater reuse, for example, um, as a potential water source? Definitely. I mean, in the Barossa, for example, that's what there, there is. I mean, interestingly, we have a wastewater reuse in South Australia, but I've been to various meetings around you know, urban greening and you know and the Barossa stuff, and everybody saying, "Oh, we've got this." Reuse water, and so but you can only use it once, right? So it's yeah, but but definitely that those are all different things to, to think about. Yeah, so all these different options are on the table, whether it's demand management or, and and obviously there's the whole from the agricultural irrigation point of view, the crop types as well. Like in South Australia, for example, there's been a big shift from annual crops to more perennial crops like almonds, um, and and you know so in the previous drought we had, you know people could respond. I guess, 
in a more agile manner. Whereas if you have perennial crops and you know and they take 10 years to reach full maturity, the, the, you know the economics is very different. And so we've got a, a big water trading market as well. Um, but you know some of the prices that uh, people pay for in uh, some of the prices in California, for example, for water are just you know off the scale compared with what we're used to. But you know, if, if there's a drought, those sort of things can come into play. So it's there's no, you know, obviously no regulation of who plants what, but you know, there's no yeah, so that whole strategic understanding of you know how, how the whole system has shifted and, and what does that mean in terms of water security and, and those sorts of things. So all, all of these different things need to be on the table. Thank you. I think there is another question here. Hi, my name is Julian. Uh, thank you for our presentation. Um, um, my, my, my question, it's, uh, it can be maybe a little bit tricky, but it's just because I'm really curious and interested about uncertainty, and you also talked a little bit about it. Um, and we, we know that it's very challenging to incorporate into our models human behavior and also uh, people's decision making. Um, and when we talk about uh, epistemic uncertainty, that is the type of uncertainty that happens when we don't actually have data, so, do you think it's um, actually help your model incorporating, like putting people in the center, incorporating this, uh, people's decision making, or your actually increases uh, the uncertainty of, our, of your results? What? Certainly, if we, if we didn't have people, it would certainly make the modeling easier. There's no question. Um, but, you know, it's all about, you know, do you go from the academic sort of realm of writing a paper to, you know, actually having a real impact? So, but, but it's a really good question, and in terms of, um, you know, I guess in the diagram I had before, I talked about how we used it in the Barossa, it was really defining the system boundary. You, you know, like, it, 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 the more work we do in this space, it, the more we realize it's all about boundary judgments, you know, because everything's connected, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, I mean, every, you know, if you want to, you know, you know, the, the global, you know, the, the global, what's happening in China might affect the, you know, for example, in Australia, we had, um, you know, there was political um, disagreements between our, our previous government and the Chinese government, and so they just you know, changed all the tariffs on the wine regulation. So that whole you know that whole region was affected in a major way. It's just coming back now where they've released it, and there's more. The trade is opening up again, um, and so everything's connected. You know, even though you're just saying I'm just want to make a decision here on my farm, you know what happens elsewhere really matters. And so it's a matter of what do we model, you know, which bits are in, which bits are out, and if they're if they're out then we need to have scenarios. You need to still consider them, but you don't model them explicitly. You have to do it via some sort of externality. Um, and so that's, to me, where you know, putting people in, into the loop is really important to understand you know, what are the things we need to, where are the system boundaries, what are the factors that are important. Because it comes down to that, you know, that trust bit. You know, if, if you just waltz in as an academic or a model and go, oh, yeah, I know what you're doing, you know, and I'm just going to model your thing and tell you what to do, that's not going to fly with anyone. You know, people. You need to draw on people's understanding and experiences. And you mentioned the indigenous. You know, whatever it is. It's, you know, people know their systems. They know that the data they're using. The, you know, the, yeah, whatever it is. Um, you just need to understand that. But it, it takes time. You know, that's the thing. I guess for me, in my stage of my career, I've sort of, you know, I'm sort of more interested in impact, like a real impact, not so much the academic stuff. Um, you know, and that's the tricky bit in a in an academic environment where you've got to publish papers and blah blah blah, whatever, and and you know, and, and doing things like talking to people and well, if you're a modeler, you know, it's, it just takes time and, and you know, it's not efficient. Um, so it really depends on what you're trying to do. But uh, but I think yeah, definitely from modeling perspective, it makes it harder. But from a, if you want to have real impact, it's essential. I think yeah. Thank you. More questions? Maybe, yeah, Kevin. Australian experience, a lot of talk, a lot of information, but very little action. So given that you're putting people at the center, I wonder what, in this new activity, I, I wonder what you, uh, the role, how you foresee the role of the social sciences in your project team, in your project at, at large? Oh, I think it's essential. You know, I think we do need to work together. You know, it's, these problems are multidisciplinary um, at the core, and we can't, you know, and often we, you know, we, you know, we, 
we sort of dabble, like, you know, you, we, 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 you know we, we're sort of strong in the modelling and then we might just, you know, um, oh, we'll, you know, we'll a bit of stakeholder engagement or whatever. And, 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 and so the more people I talk to, they, they all end up doing the same things, but just from a different lens, right? Like, um, we have a, uh, on open day, I don't know if you've got open days for universities here, but, you know, we have a, where students come and have a look and we, I'm on the sustainability panel usually, and there's people from different disciplines and we usually end up saying the same thing, you know, just the, the, the science, the science people bring in engineers to solve the problems, and and, you know, and social scientists, and the social scientists bring in the engineers because they realise they need you know more technical solutions, and we bring in social scientists. So I think that is, is just essential to work together, and it's just nice in this in our project we've got you know a group of people from different backgrounds um, as as part of the core team, and obviously there's usually challenges around funding and you know how much goes around, but we'll hopefully be able to draw in other people from the industry partners as well. Um, but again, it does take time. You know, whenever you work um, in multidisciplinary teams, it takes more time because we need to have this common language and different terminology and all that sort of stuff. And so again, it's really essential, but it's not efficient if you just you know want to publish papers and things like that. So it's that that's the that's the tricky bit. Um, but I think it's at the boundaries also. You know, new knowledge always occurs at the boundaries, right? You know, and that's and so that's why I think there's a lot of you know, benefit to, to to working across those boundaries. Yeah. But again, so just in our, you know, in Australia generally, you know, the, the way funding, you know, source fundings, like the NSERC equivalent, for example, it would be hard to get it. It's harder to get an inter interdisciplinary project up than it is just to go one that's sort of nice and clear and crisp and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. More questions? So while I'm running over, I have one more question. So we're talking about people, but what about, you, I also heard you t talk about regulation. And, and often uh, a lot of problems also originate in the fact that there are property rights assigned to water. Is that an issue where you do your cases? Um, I'm not 100% sure, Roy, to be honest. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, I, I think that'll probably come out as part of the case study. So really we're, you know, it's, it's as I said, Anything's, you know, we're open to whatever comes up. Um, but I haven't really, this is sort of, a, I started in the water space, but I've done most of my work in the natural hazard and the renewable energy space in the last, you know, 10 years or so. So this is sort of a return home for me in, in a way. So um, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not, I haven't worked in the basin for, for, for a while. Did my PhD work in that, but that was a little, little while ago. But yeah, so I'm sure a lot of those things will come up. and. You know, we're not going to solve all the problems. You know, I think it's a matter of how far can we push, you know, push the boundary and rely, reliant on those champions. You know, in the other work we're doing, natural hazard work, for example, which has now been adopted by the state government in Western Australia. They've written it into their climate policy and we've got a three-year project to roll it out across government. And, and that's really been one, one person that's been you know, a constant over the last sort of 10 years to really push it along. And if you don't have those champions, and so we're, we're hoping that through the case studies we can hopefully inspire enough people who can see the value of it um, to, to do that because, yeah, just a bunch of academics doing things is not going to change anything. So we really have to, yeah, rely on spreading it that way, yeah. We have one more question here. Uh, I'm Lucas, and I was just wondering, you sort of mentioned this a bit briefly, um, but a lot of this is aimed towards providing information to make decisions um, and sort of to those decision makers. Uh, and I was wondering if there's any sort of um, um, goals of the part of the project to provide this sort of information to non-decision makers um, and like other community members. Is, is there a part that sort of provides information and disseminates that information uh, in a way that I feel like uh, communities could understand? Yep. Definitely, I think that's part of it. So it depends on how you define decision making. You know whether that's a democratic process or an autocratic process. And so I guess we're, you know, we, we a lot of those processes, particularly in the regions, are, are you know, the community has a huge impact. And so making sure people understand what's going on is going to be key. I mean, we had we've had a few, well, Avril, Avril Horn and I we we did a you know, site visit to all the different regions and just you know, and driving around with people. Like if someone you know drives around the catchment. Um, that's a great chance to talk to them, you know, you sort of try to tentatively pitch your idea and go, you know, is this complete rubbish or, you know, what, what, you know, and so the idea actually, what came out is the idea of risk management was something that, because that, when you're talking to farmers, you know, they're all used to managing risk, you know, they all make decisions around that, you know, and so uh, if you can just, if you can just sort of say, look, you know, well, this might be a, a way to help you better understand where the thresholds are for you, where the risks are. 
So it's really, the, the language is going to be key. You know, how do you, how do you get people on board so they actually understand what's going on and it, it, it fits in with their view of the world. You know, this is, if, if you can say, look, I know you're doing this already and we're just helping you do what you're doing. Um, or we're trying to help you to do what you're doing, not telling you you're doing it wrong. It's, you know. And so I think that's, that's the key. If you say, look, what you're doing now, we're doing it completely differently now, even though I've mentioned that, that that's, that's not the way to go. Um, and, and so getting, yeah, you really need to get people on board because that's, particularly in the, in the regional areas, that's how things are, are getting done. So, yeah. Thank you uh, very, very much, uh, Holger. Let's give uh, Professor Meyer one more round of applause for, for his engagement presentation. And dealing with the, uh, with the Inquisition.